Next, I want to cover the steps that are required to obtain a general distinguishing number. That's your GDN or your dealer's license. And we're going to cover the entire process, including submitting your application, fingerprinting, your business building, your display area, your business sign and business hours, the state's dealer surety bond requirements, and then we're going to cover registering your name with the Secretary of State's office, registering with OCCC if financing, records, I-9 employment form, your employer identification number, and sometimes we call that your EIN, your dealer educational course, and then I'm going to show you how to pay your license fees with credit card or e-check. Submitting your dealer application at e-licensing. You must submit your dealer application through the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles e-licensing website. Your application must be submitted online. The Texas Department of Motor Vehicles no longer accepts dealer license applications by mail. You may submit your dealer license application at the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles website, which you see right here. And you will be able to pay your license fees with credit card or an e-check. I want you to be aware the application process is quite extensive and must be completed correctly and it's in, in its entirety. Mistakes on your dealer application can cause significant delays in your licensing process. If you do need any assistance during the licensing process, you can call 888-368-4689, which is the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles Consumer Relations Division, and we will submit a dealer license application later in your dealer training course. Fingerprinting and criminal history review. The Texas Department of Motor Vehicles has adopted a new rule requiring certain new dealer license applicants and existing dealer license holders to be fingerprinted. All dealer applicants will be subject to the new fingerprint requirement as a part of the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles efforts to prevent fraud. The board adopted a rule requiring applicants for and holders of all types of general distinguishing numbers to be fingerprinted. All persons acting in a representative capacity for a dealer license applicant or holder of a dealer's license must also be fingerprinted. Even if you have been previously fingerprinted for another license or by another government agency, you are still required to submit the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles a new set of fingerprints. You do not have to get fingerprints every time you renew your license. The fingerprint requirement is a one-time requirement if an active license is maintained. However, if you fail to submit a timely renewal or if you ever allow your license to be closed, you will be required to submit a new set of fingerprints fingerprints when you apply for your subsequent license in the future. Fingerprinting services are provided through a fingerprint provider called Identigo, and you're going to pay your fingerprint fees directly to the fingerprint provider. Results of the fingerprinting will be sent directly to the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles from both the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Records Division and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If you cannot schedule an appointment, at a LiveScan Identigo location, or if you are located outside the state of Texas, then you must be fingerprinted in ink on a standard FD-258 fingerprint card at your local law enforcement agency or other agency that's certified for fingerprinting. Here's some additional instructions regarding this method of submission. So when you receive your instructional email from the Motor Vehicle Division, it is very important to follow those fingerprint instructions correctly. The following dealer, applicants, and license holders are required to be fingerprinted. Franchise motor vehicle dealers, independent motor vehicle dealers, wholesale motor vehicle dealers, motorcycle dealers, trailer dealers, and trailer or semi-trailer dealers, and independent mobility motor vehicle dealers as well. The following persons must be fingerprinted. Owners, presidents, managing partners, persons acting in a representative ca capacity for an applicant or license, including the applicant or the officers, directors, members, managers, trustees, partners, principals, or managers of business affairs. Once your application is submitted to the Motor Vehicle Division, the Motor Vehicle Division will review it to determine who on your application needs to be fingerprinted. The Motor Vehicle Division will send an email to the application contact notifying them who on the application is required to be fingerprinted. Fingerprinting services will be available through the approved vendor Identigo, 
please do not go to the vendor to get fingerprints taken until after you receive confirmation from the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles, Motor Vehicle Division, that the fingerprints are required. I wanna repeat that very important statement. Do not report to your fingerprint location until after you receive confirmation from the Motor Vehicle Division that your fingerprints are required. Fingerprints are now required for most dealer license applicants before you receive your dealer's license from the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. The Texas Department of Motor Vehicles must review your criminal history and the criminal history of all owners and managers that are listed on the license. All owners and managers must disclose all prior offenses, both convictions and those that resulted in deferred adjudication. In any jurisdiction, all convictions and deferred adjudications must be disclosed regardless of whether a sentence was completed or is considered dismissed or expunged. I also want you to be aware that once a license has been issued, any new offenses that result in conviction or deferred adjudication by any owner or manager in any jurisdiction must be reported immediately through e-licensing by selecting the amend a license option. Criminal history will be reviewed on all new license applications, renewal license applications, and amendment applications that reflect any ownership changes or management changes. The existence of a criminal history does not automatically disqualify a person from gaining a dealer's license. The Department of Motor Vehicles will review criminal history on a case-by-case -case basis. When you complete the information when applying for your license through the e-licensing system, you must answer all questions correctly, not only for yourself, but for any owner and manager listed on the application. If you make false statements during your application process, you may have your license denied, canceled or revoked, or suspended. You may also face criminal prosecution. Many of the rules governing criminal history are listed in the Criminal Offense Guidelines in Chapter 43 of the Texas Administrative Code Rule 211.3. <laughs> Did you catch all that? Uh, in just a little while, I am going to show you how to easily look up the rules in the Texas Administrative Code. If you have a criminal history, court records must be submitted with your dealer application as well. And I want you to be aware those records can usually be obtained by contacting the district court or the county in which that offense occurred. Next, I want to cover what are known as your premises requirements. And we are going to cover your building and office requirements, the retail display lot, retail dealer hours, wholesale dealer hours, retail sign requirements, and wholesale sign requirements. First, let's talk about your business building. Your business building, you must have a place of business to be used for the purpose of selling motor vehicles. It must be located in a building with connecting exterior walls on each side, and those walls must be at least seven foot high. The building must meet all local zoning requirements. The building must either be owned or if the building is leased, the lease must be for at least two years. You must have an office in that building for the operation of your dealership. If the office is located at a private residence, it must be completely separate from the actual resident and must meet the zoning requirements from your city or your county. Before you rent or purchase a building to operate your dealership, you must contact your local planning and zoning office at your city hall or possibly your county courthouse to ensure that you can operate a dealership at that location. A certificate of occupancy, or what we sometimes call a COO, is required to be submitted if a certificate of occupancy is required by your city or county. So the certificate of occupancy must be in the name of the dealer's business and must state the use. For example, it must clearly disclose that you'll be selling motor vehicles. Texas Department of Motor Vehicles enforcement officers may request documentation to ensure that all zoning requirements have been met. The office should have, at minimum, a desk, two chairs, internet access, and a working telephone listed in your dealership name. I want to repeat that very important information. Your office must include, at minimum, a desk, two chairs, internet access, and a working telephone listed in your dealership name. The dealer phone number may never be shared with another dealer. You must have your own phone number, and by the way, the internet access that you're required to have may be wireless internet access. If a dealer shares their location with another business, the dealer must have their own office area. 
the state does allow up to four retail dealers in one building and up to eight wholesale dealers in one building. But wholesale dealers and retail dealers may never operate out of the same office or the same building. Lease agreement sublease. If the lease agreement is a sublease in which the property owner is not the lesser, the dealer must also obtain a sign and notarized statement from the property owner that includes the following information. You'll have to have the property owner's full name, email address, mailing address, and phone number, as well as written confirmation that the dealer is authorized to sublease that location and may operate vehicle sales from that business location. So this scenario would apply to you if you are not leasing the property directly from the owner of the property, but instead are leasing the property from someone else that is leasing it from the owner. And this is known as a sublease. If this situation applies to you, then you will need the additional information from the actual property owner. Now let's talk a little bit more about your office requirements. Your office may not be located in a residence, apartment, hotel, motel, rooming house, or any room or building not open to the public. It can't be a virtual or what's known as provided by subscription. Your office must be open to the public during the entirety of your posted business hours. And that could be an issue with later weekend hours if, or if it cannot be locked or is otherwise inaccessible. Mixed use commercial spaces are okay. For example, if you have an office space on the ground floor with residents above, but it could never be located in a garage attached to a residence. The office must have a separate entrance if located within a restaurant, gas station, or convenience store. Your office must have at least 100 square feet of interior floor space that does not include hallways, closets, or restrooms. This is a very strict interpretation uh, and proof of measurements may be required if your office is close to the minimum. If construction is required to meet the space requirement, then it must be completed prior to the state issuing your dealer's license. It does not meet compliance with other requirements. Say, for example, if a wall or shared space would actually lower the square footage to, uh, below the minimum. If, say, for example, you had to construct a wall to meet the minimum requirements and the new wall reduced your square footage below the minimum requirements, your office would not be in compliance. So make sure that you meet the minimum square foot requirements for your office. And also, I want you to be aware that uh, make sure that that office at minimum has a desk, two chairs, internet access, and a working telephone in the name of the business or the DBA. If you are the only dealer at the location, your lobby does not need to be separated from the office area. Portable type offices. Portable type offices would include repurposed RVs. They would only qualify as an office if they do not readily, if they're not readily movable, such as if the tires have been removed or they're connected to a power source and have that minimum of seven foot high ceilings and meet the 100 square foot office space minimum. Finally, let's talk about shared office spaces. As I stated a moment ago, no more than four retail dealers or eight wholesale dealers can be licensed in the same building. You cannot have a mix of wholesale and retail dealers licensed in the same building. A pending application cannot be approved if it's in conflict with this requirement until the existing dealer's license has been officially closed or revoked. This includes situations where a site visit and or a property owner discussion has confirmed the existing dealer is no longer at the license location. A business owned by the same individual at the same location is not required to have a separate office or office equipment. They are required to have a separate phone number and business sign if the business names are different from one another. If the office is shared with another dealer or business not owned by the same individual, there must be that permanent floor to ceiling wall separation and the walls must be made of drywall, masonry, wood, cement, etc. And you've got to have a hinged door separating business offices that are owned by different individuals as well as, well as shared lobby and waiting areas. Your display area. Your display area must be sufficient size to display at least five vehicles of the type for which your GDN is issued. And I want to repeat that very important information. Your display area must be sufficient size to display at least five of the vehicles for the type of which your GDN is issued. Say, for example, you have a motor vehicle license. 
you'll need at least enough space to display five motor vehicles. If you have a motorcycle license, you'll need at least five spaces that can display motorcycles. If you're a semi-truck dealer, then you would need, excuse me, a semi-trailer dealer, then you would need enough room to display at least five semi-trailers. Those spaces must be reserved exclusively for the retail dealer's inventory and may not be shared or intermingled with another business or public parking area or a driveway to the office or another dealer's display area. So you can never intermingle inventory whatsoever with another licensed dealer or a neighboring business owner. The display area may be located outside of the building or inside the building. This retail sales area must be kept separate from any wholesale vehicles being held for resale as well. Also, retail and salvage inventory needs to be kept separate at all times. The display lot cannot be a driveway and must be some type of hard surface such as concrete or gravel. Some local zoning ordinances may require a dealer or display lot to be paved. The lot must meet all local zoning requirements. The display lot must be separated from any other businesses or repair shops or driveways to other businesses or another dealership's display area. And as stated earlier, if a retail dealer shares a display area or parking lot with another business, including another dealer, the dealer inventory must be separated from the other business's display lot or parking area by some type of barrier which cannot be readily removed. Such separation must be properly maintained during your entire period of licensure which is a used motor vehicle in which a used motor vehicle dealer license is being held. If a dealer is going to operate at night, the display area must be illuminated. Dealers can have a display area that is not part of the lot. The display area must be located at the retail dealer's business address or contiguous with the retail dealer's address as well. A non-contiguous Storage lot is permissible only if there's no public access and no sales activity occurs at the storage lot. A sign stating the retail dealer's name, telephone number, and the fact the property is a storage lot is permissible. If you do have a storage lot, I want you to be aware, since there's no sales activity allowed there, if your customer is interested in a vehicle that you have on a storage lot, then you or a salesperson would need to bring the vehicle from the storage lot to the retail lot to show the vehicle. You may never have any type of sales activity on a storage lot. I want you to be aware once you become a licensed dealer, you may only have retail sales activity at your licensed location. And I want to talk about this for just a moment. Let's say your lot is in downtown Austin and someone just outside the city finds your vehicle for sale on the internet. They might state that they can't make it downtown and ask you to bring that vehicle to a parking lot near their home. You can never ever show a vehicle at a non-licensed location. Conducting any type of retail sales activity away from your license location is a violation of the law. So you will have to explain to some of your customers that the state does not allow you to show your vehicles at a location away from the dealership. The retail sales activity may only take place at your licensed location. And wholesale motor vehicle dealers are exempt from the display area requirement. Now we're going to talk about the posting of your business hours. Hours for each day of the week must be posted on the sign. Hours must be posted at the main entrance of the office. The dealership must be staffed by a bona fide owner or employee. If you change your hours of operation, the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles does not need to be notified. I want you to be aware, if your location is surrounded by a gate, you are encouraged to also post the hours at the entrance to the property gate unless the posted hours are easily visible from the street. Now let's go over business hours for retail dealers. A retail dealer's office shall be open at least four days per week for at least four consecutive hours per day and may not be open solely by appointment. I wanna repeat that very, very important information. A retail dealer's office shall be open at least four days per week for at least four consecutive hours per day and may not be open solely by appointment. The retail dealer's business hours for each day of the week must be posted at the main entrance of the retail dealer's office that is accessible to the public. The owner or bona fide employee of the retail dealer shall be at the retail dealer's license location during the posted business hours for the purpose of buying, selling, exchanging, or leasing vehicles. 
Any customer must be able to view your inventory without an appointment. If the owner or a bona fide employee is not available to conduct business during the retail dealer's posted business hours due to some special circumstances or an emergency, a separate sign must be posted indicating the date and the time that the retail dealer will resume operations. Regardless of the retail dealer's business hours, the retail dealer's phone must be answered from 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. weekdays by a bona fide employee, owner, answering service, voicemail service, or answering machine. A caller must be able to speak to a natural person or leave a message during these hours. Now let's talk about wholesale hours. Business hours for wholesale dealers. A wholesale dealer must be open at least two weekdays per week for at least two consecutive hours per day. A wholesale motor vehicle dealer may not be open solely by appointment. A dealer that holds a wholesale motor vehicle dealer's GDN must post its business hours at the main entrance of the wholesale motor vehicle dealer's office. A wholesale motor vehicle dealer or bona fide employee shall be at the wholesale motor vehicle dealer's license location at least two weekdays per week for at least two consecutive hours per day. Regardless of the wholesale motor vehicle dealer's business hours, the wholesale motor vehicle dealer's telephone must be answered from 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. by a bona fide employee, owner, answering service, voicemail service, or answering machine. A caller must be able to speak to a natural person or leave a message during business hours. Next, I want to talk about your business sign because you will need a permanent business sign that is visible from the public roadway. The dealership name on a sign must match either the DBA certificate filed with the county for sole proprietors and general partnerships or the business name DBA registered with the Texas Secretary of State. If you're opening your business as a corporation, LLC, or LP, and by the way, we're going to cover business registrations in just a few moments, always make sure the sign mounted on your address is the same exact name as listed on your dealer license application. Your sign must match the exact name as your dealership is listed on the application. The sign is not required to have business entity information, such as Inc. or LLC or LP, etc., the sign must be permanent in nature and be clearly visible to the public. Most printing companies can produce a permanent business sign at a very minimal cost for you. There are different sign requirements for retail dealers versus wholesale dealers, and I want to cover each one of those requirements right now. First, let's talk about retail sign requirements. The sign must be visible to the public within 100 feet of the main entrance of the business office. The business name or DBA listed on the sign must be at least six inches in lettering or more. I want to repeat that. Your dealership name needs to be at least six inches high or larger on that sign. That's a state law. The sign must be made of rigid, durable, weather-resistant materials such as corrugated plastic, metal, wood, or a combination of these weather-resistant materials. The sign cannot be a banner or what's known as a hardened banner, and it's a banner that's been bolted to like plywood or a frame and then mounted to the structure. And by the way, if you are currently using a banner, then you'll need to provide an invoice of permanent sign and written statement confirming that you have paid for a sign and when it will be appropriately mounted. The sign must be bolted to the structure or bolted or welded to a fence or other permanently installed in-ground sign pole or sign support. I want to cover some of the exceptions for you. A sign can be painted onto a structure or a window. A sign can be affixed to a window with permanent vinyl lettering. A sign can be etched into a door or a window. And a sign can also be affixed with permanent adhesive. Now, if you have a fence-mounted sign, it must be permanently bolted or welded to the fence. No zip ties, rope, metal ties, etc. can be used in place of a sign being bolted or welded. Now I want to talk about the exterior wholesale sign requirements. A couple of requirements for wholesalers regarding signs are a little bit different from retailers. The sign must be visible to the public within 100 feet of the main entrance of the office. The business name DBA listed on the sign must be at least six inches high in lettering as well. Now I want you to be very clear that Texas state law requires wholesale dealers to post a statement that says, Purchasers must be licensed dealers with a minimum of three inch lettering in height. I want to quickly reiterate that requirement. Wholesale dealers must include a statement that says 
Purchasers must be licensed dealers in letters that are at least three inches tall. The wholesale sign must be made of rigid, durable, weather-resistant material as well. The sign cannot be a banner or, once again, a hardened banner, which is just a banner attached to plywood. If you are currently using a banner, then you have to provide an invoice of the permanent sign order and written statement confirming the sign will be appropriately amounted upon delivery. Your sign must be permanently mounted. The sign must be bolted to a structure or bolted or welded to a fence or other permanently installed in-ground sign pole or sign support. And once again, on the wholesale sign, you know, you can always request a written statement regarding how that sign must be affixed, especially from your local zoning authority. Signs can be painted onto a structure or window. They can be affixed to the window with permanent vinyl lettering. They can be etched into a door. Wholesale signs can be affixed with permanent adhesive. And remember, once again, if you have a fence-mounted sign, the sign must be permanently bolted or welded to the fence, and the chain-link fence signs are only acceptable if appropriately bolted or welded. Remember, no zip ties, rope, metal ties, etc. can be used in place of a sign being bolted. So do please keep that in mind. Now I want to talk about interior wholesale business sign. If an outdoor sign is not permitted at your office location and you're a wholesale dealer, then this must be clearly annotated in the lease agreement within the special provisions or sign paragraph. That sign must be visible to the public within 10 feet of the main door of the dealer's business office. Business name located only in a lobby directory is not sufficient. The DBA listed on a sign in that scenario must be at least two inches high in height. Remember, you must also include the statement, purchasers must be licensed dealers, but if outside signage is not allowed, then you need at least a minimum one inch lettering with the statement that says purchasers must be licensed dealers if an outdoor sign is not allowed, okay? Remember, if an outdoor sign is allowed, your statement must read purchasers must be licensed dealers in at least three inch high letters. Hope you got all that. But if your location does not allow exterior signs, then the statement that purchasers must be licensed dealers must be in at least one inch in height. The sign must be made of durable material and lettering that cannot be changed. It must be permanently mounted on or beside the main door of the dealer's business office. Saturday and Sunday business hours. Texas blue law prohibits a dealer from selling vehicles on consecutive Saturdays and Sundays. A dealer may choose to be open on Saturday or Sunday, but not a consecutive Saturday and Sunday. For example, a dealer could be open on Saturday this week and Sunday the following week or vice versa, but never on Saturday and Sunday on the same weekend. Travel trailer and trailer semi-dealers may operate seven days a week. If you hold a motor vehicle license and a trailer license, then you may open on Saturdays and Sundays consecutively, but cannot sell motor vehicles on a consecutive Saturday and Sunday. I want to repeat that. If a person holds a motor vehicle license and a trailer license, you may only op you may open on Saturdays and Sundays, but cannot sell motor vehicles on a consecutive Saturday and Sunday. Motor vehicles can only be sold on a Saturday or Sunday that are not consecutive. Never on a Saturday and Sunday on the same weekend. I hope you caught all that. Your deal is surety bond. You must obtain a $50,000 dealer surety bond in order to obtain a Texas used motor vehicle dealer's license. I want to repeat that. You must obtain a $50,000 dealer surety bond in order to obtain a Texas used motor vehicle dealer's license. The surety bond is used for replenishing funds used to compensate retail purchasers of motor vehicles. The name and address on the dealer surety bond must match exactly the name on the dealer application filed with the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. The bond must be issued in the legal first and last name of a sole proprietor or a general partnership that the business is a sole proprietor or a general partnership. For all other business entities that file with the Texas Secretary of State's office, the name must match the exact full name of the registered name, business name exactly. The bond must be issued for two years and must start on the first day of the month and end on the last day of the month corresponding to your licensure term. For example, if your dealer license is issued from September 1st, 2023 to August 31st of 2025, your dealer surety bond will correspond with your licensing dates. You must maintain your bond 
during your entire licensure period. You can never, ever let your dealer surety bond coverage lapse. Here's a sample of a Texas dealer surety bond that you are going to obtain. I want to cover some very important bond instructions with you right now. You must sign your bond for it to be in full effect. The bond must be signed by either an owner, officer, or proprietor. This is one of the most common mistakes and can cause delay in your dealer license approval. Do not forget to sign your bond before you submit a copy of this bond through e-licensing. And your bond is issued in two separate pages. This is the first page, and this is the actual bond that you see right here. And here you see the second page of the dealer surety bond, which is referred to as the dealer surety bond power of attorney. This form must also be submitted with your bond when you're applying for your dealer's license. And it will be signed by the persons that sell you your bond, such as an insurance agent. The bond must be signed by both the owner and the bond company representative. A bond writer might be required if the bond information is incorrect or needs to be revised. Franchisees, travel trailer dealers, and semi-trailer dealers are exempt from the dealer surety bond requirement. I want you to be aware, are you going to pay $50,000 for your bond? No, absolutely not. The price of your bond is based on your credit score. And you can purchase a bond from an insurance agency or a bonding company. When you complete the course, we'll send you an automated email with final licensing instructions and also a link to our website where you can submit your bond quote through the texasdealers.com website. If you do choose to go that route, they can send your bond quote to over 30 different bond carriers based on your credit score. And as you see there at the bottom of the screen, state law does now require that you post your bond notice and claim instructions right next to your dealer's license. I want to repeat that very important information. The law requires that you post your bond notice and claim instructions right next to your dealer's license. And here you see a copy of the notice that I just spoke of. You will need to enter your bond company, your bond number, and the phone number of your bond company as well. The law requires that you display this next to your bond and your dealer's license. So make sure that you're displaying this and you can easily download this form. You can just go to texasdealers.com and scroll down on any page and click on the Texas dealer forms and just, just click on the link that reads Texas dealer notice of surety bond. And then you'll easily be able to download that official form from the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles website. The dealer bond notice and claim instructions, once again, are required by the state to be posted right next to your dealer's license. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of that. And once again, you will be emailed a link for your dealer surety bond quote. So we can send that to one of over 30 different bond carriers based on your credit score, or you can call an insurance agent or bonding company that specializes in surety bonds. Registering your business with the Texas Secretary of State. You must also register your business name with the Texas Secretary of State and include copies of each registration with your dealer license application. Most business entities will be filing this paperwork with the Texas Secretary of State because the Texas Secretary of State wants to have a record of every business that is operating in the state, including this business that you're getting ready to open. Sole proprietors and general partnerships are excluded. However, sole proprietors and general partnerships must file what's called an assumed name certificate in any county that they operate. If they're using a name other than their proper name, then registering your business with the Secretary of State would be required. So we will cover this extensively later on in your dealer training course. But for additional information for registering your business, you can contact the Texas Secretary of State's business and commercial section via email. And that's going to be corpinfo at sos.texas.gov. Or you can call them directly 512-463-5555. Licensing with the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. If financing before you offer third-party financing or possibly buy here financing, every dealer must obtain a license with the Texas Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner, or what we sometimes refer to as the OCCC. And you can obtain the license or information about it at license at occ.texas.gov, or you can call them directly at 512-936-7600. And we're going to cover the licensing process with the Office of Consumer Credit Commission Commissioner extensively later on in your dealer training course. I'm going to do my very best to prepare you 
for your new business. Records. You must maintain records on all vehicles purchased, leased, and sold for a minimum of 48 months. That's four years. So the way that Texas law reads, the current and previous 13 months of records must be kept at the dealer's license location and be ready to be produced for inspection by Texas Department of Motor Vehicles representative. The remaining 35 months of records can be stored at a location other than the license location. Records can be stored either via paper or electronically, but they've got to be stored for at least four years. That's 48 months. Federal law requires some records to be kept for at least five years. And we are going to review an entire section on exactly what records to keep later on in your dealer training course. I-9 Employment Eligibility Form. This employment eligibility verification form, it's called the I-9. It is a U.S. Citizenship Immigration Services form and is used by an employer to verify an employee's identity and to establish that the worker is, in fact, eligible to accept employment in the United States. And you can find it at www.uscis.gov. Federal law does require that you complete this form for every person whose name appears on the dealer license and all future employees. You do not need to submit this form with your application, but you must store a copy of this form at your dealership. Employer Identification Number, or EIN. Before you submit your dealer license application, you must obtain an employer identification number, which is also known as a tax ID or a tax ID number or an EIN. This number is used to identify the new business that you're starting and will be needed for tax purposes. Obtaining this number is a very quick and easy step that will only take a few minutes, and you can easily apply at the IRS website, that's irs.gov, and have your new employer identification number in a matter of moments. After you've been assigned your EIN, be sure to include it on your dealer license submission. And once again, we're going to cover this process extensively later on in your dealer training course. Speaking of your dealer educational course, a six-hour web-based pre-licensed training requirement applies only to dealers with an independent motor vehicle GDM. These dealers are licensed to buy, sell, or exchange used cars, trucks, motorhomes, neighborhood vehicles, recreational off-road vehicles, those are ROVs, all-terrain vehicles, which are ATVs, and utility vehicles, which we refer to as UTVs. Most applicants for new licenses and renewals Applicants less, that were licensed less than 10 years on September 1st of 2019 would have been required to complete a one-time training. An owner or manager listed on the application must be the person to complete the course. If a person who completes the course leaves the dealership or the business, then another owner or manager for the business must take the course prior to the next renewal. If a dealer's been licensed for more than 10 years as of September 1st of 2019, then that dealer would not have been required to take a course. If a dealer has been licensed for 10 years or less, then only the renewal course would have been required. If you've already taken this course, then you can always renew for your license. You won't ever have to take this course again once you've completed it. So you're just going to take that dealer certificate of completion and upload it through e-licensing when you are applying. And make sure that you keep a copy of this on file. It will never ever expire. So at the end of the course, that certificate will pop up automatically on your screen. Make sure and save several copies. You might keep this for many, many years. So rather than taking the course again, you'll receive your certificate at the end of the course. So hang on to it forever because it doesn't expire. Well, you will need to submit this with your initial application when you submit it through e-licensing. And I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that as well here in just a little while. Here's your licensing fees. The fees for your dealer license are listed below, and this is the current fees. So this example shows one optional metal dealer license plate, and you're gonna be able to pay for your license securely with a credit card or e-check. Most, but not all GDN dealers may receive up to two dealer plates. And there you can see the general distinguishing number fee is currently $700, and metal dealer plate fees are $90. And we are going to cover this extensively here in just a little while as well. Very important for you to be aware. Texas law requires that all dealers' licenses are displayed prominently at the business location. And the law also requires that you display your bond information right next to your dealer's license, as we discussed just a few moments ago. All dealer licenses are valid 
or two years from the date of issuance. If your license requires a dealer surety bond, your license will expire on the same day as the dealer surety bond expiration. You may not start the operation of your dealership until you receive your dealer's license, that's your GDM. All dealer license applications, renewals, and amendments must be submitted online through the e-licensing system. It is your responsibility to renew your dealer license in a timely manner. Dealers are able to submit a license renewal application up to 180 days prior to the license renewal date. It is recommended that you submit your dealer license renewal application as soon as possible once the renewal window opens. Dealers have only 90 days after the license expiration date to submit their renewal application. Late penalty fees are charged when the renewal application is submitted more than 30 days after the license expiration date. A dealer may operate multiple locations within the same city. Dealers must submit an amendment application in e-licensing if relocating within the same city or adding or removing an additional location. Any additional locations in the same city are considered supplemental locations that do not require a separate dealer's license. Dealer's licenses are city-specific, and a separate dealer license is required for every city a dealer is operating in. If a dealer relocates to a new city, then a new license, including a new dealer surety bond, is required. Remember, independent motor vehicle dealers may operate as a salvage dealer without obtaining a separate salvage license. However, a sales and use tax permit would be required if operating as a salvage dealer, along with a National Motor Vehicle Title Information System number as well. And we'll talk about that here in just a little while. All GDN and salvage inventory must remain completely separated.